Hello, uh, we're going to be starting to look at PyTorch soon. And, uh, and to understand PyTorch, we need to learn a little bit more about some hardware trade-offs, uh, both to install it and to um, kind of understand how to use it effectively. So first off, like what is PyTorch? Um, it's a lot like NumPy. Uh, we can have these n-dimensional arrays, which are kind of equivalently called tensors now. And, um, and it's going to be really easy to move uh, matrices represented as these tensors to the GPU and do operations there and maybe move answers back. Um, it's also going to be uh, really easy to compute gradients. And I may be talking more about what that is. For those of you who have taken calculus, you're probably familiar with derivatives. And um, a gradient is just a derivative evaluated at a certain point. So you can imagine we have some sort of line and we're computing the slope at a given point. That's a gradient. And, um, and that's going to be very useful for optimizing things. <clears throat> um, you, if you did take calculus, you probably have some sense that derivatives are closely related to finding minimums or maximums. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to be kind of building off some of those ideas here. And I'm not really going to assume any calculus knowledge, so don't worry if you don't understand what that means right now. Uh, what are we going to be optimizing? Well, we're often going to be optimizing coefficients. For example, if I'm doing a linear regression, I might want to find what the best coefficients are in each variable. And then the third thing that PyTorch lets us do um, that we're not going to really cover at all in this class is to construct uh, deep learning neural networks. And um, so just kind of know that that's possible, but we aren't going to do it here. And so there's a bunch of great tutorials if you kind of want to go beyond what we're doing in 320, and I'm giving a link to that. So the first challenge that we're going to have to come overcome before we can use it is actually installing it. And it turns out installing it uses a lot of, of memory. Right? So I'm going to talk about that at the end of, of this video segment. OK, so why um, I mentioned kind of back here, the first benefit is that we can move computation to the GPU. Um, why would we want to do that? Uh, well, here I'm actually pasting a table from the Spock Python machine uh, learning by Sebastian Rochka, actually a, a professor in the statistics department here on campus and, and sometimes teaches courses about machine learning. Um, anyway, in this table, he's comparing a CPU on the left to a GPU on the right. And when you're buying either CPUs or graphics processing units, there's all kinds of different statistics that, uh, that you might look at. And, um, and so maybe like the first statistic that might catch your eye is, well, how many cores does it have? How many things can it do in parallel? And, um, and you can see here for this CPU, there's eight cores. For the GPU, there's like 3,500 some. And, um, but you can't directly compare those. It's not an apples to apples comparison. Um, for one, uh, some of these cores might be ticking faster than others. So you might be tempted then to jump from looking at the cores to what is the base clock frequency. Um, we can see that the cores for the CPU are faster. Um, so every three point, or I'm sorry, there's 3.2 uh, billion uh, clock ticks per second. That's what uh, gigahertz is a, is a billion uh, ticks per second. And, um, and so we can see definitely like the, the clock that's internal to this CPU is faster than the one uh, for the GPU. But even that's not necessarily going to tell us things, right? Because um, the speed of a core is not directly uh, related to that um, as much as you might think. Um, it turns out that what really matters is how fast we can process instructions. And, uh, and these devices are not doing one instruction per cycle, right? Maybe, maybe one device does an instruction every three cycles, another one might do it every two cycles. Um, so, so these numbers that people tend to key on, the number of cores and the base clock frequency, uh, don't tell you as much as you, as you might expect. And there's other complexities as well. Now, I'm not going to talk about bandwidth now. Um, if you really want to compare hardware, uh, it's, it's so complicated that what you really have to do is you just have to run whatever your program is on it and time how long that takes. And, um, and when we're using a program and running it simply for the purpose of kind of measuring how long it takes to do a kind of work, uh, that program is, is called a benchmark. And you can turn any program you want into a benchmark if you kind of start using it for just kind of measuring how fast the hardware is. And, and so my advice is always look at how uh, you can run some sort of benchmark to make comparisons between the performance of different hardware. And, uh, and depending on uh, what your benchmark is doing and kind of what kind of work you're trying to measure, uh, maybe one device or the other uh, might be better. So for a lot of this um, kind of heavy computational machine learning stuff, uh, matrix multiplications, that kind of thing, uh, what we really care about um, is number crunching. And, and by number crunching, if I want to get a little more formal, what we really care about is doing floating point um, operation, right? You're familiar with the integers and floats. Uh, we're going to be dealing with lots of floats now. And, and so 
how many operations, like additions, multiplications, whatever, can we can we do per second? And um, and so they can run benchmarks and evaluate both these hardware platforms. And so there's some numbers down here at the bottom that are, are highlighted, and we can see that uh, the CPU gets uh, 409 gigaflops, uh, uh, or uh, billion gigas, billion uh, floating point operations per second. And uh, and while the if I look at the GPU, that's like about getting 28 times more, right? So the GPU is way faster than this. So if you're comparing performance, that's a measure you should look at, right? Here's a, a, a floating point operation benchmark, and we can see that the GPU is far, far faster. Now, of course, that's not the only thing. It matters how much it costs too, right? Because I could imagine buying more CPUs and more GPUs. It turns out that this um, GPU here, that's 28 times faster, is actually $300 uh, cheaper. So for this kind of operation, this is definitely giving you a lot more speed uh, for the money. For other kinds of operations, it could definitely go the other way, right? Maybe the CPU is a cheaper is a cheaper option. Okay, so that's why I want to move things to the GPU for like our matrix um, operations. Um, the other kind of hardware trade-off I want to talk about that's going to be relevant to actually getting it installed is memory versus storage. And let's just review kind of the trade-offs between these. Uh, memory uh, is much faster than storage, right? And by memory, I mean RAM, random access memory. Um, by storage, maybe I, I mean like a solid state disk or a hard disk drive. I might abbreviate those SSD or HDD. Um, so storage is much slower, regardless of even if you have an SSD. SSDs are still much slower than RAM. Um, uh, in terms of size, uh, we usually get much larger storage uh, per dollar. Maybe we get uh, more gigabytes per dollar. Um, the, the last characteristic that we will really care about is whether or not it's persistent, which means if I reboot my computer, is my data still there? And with storage, the answer is yes. And with memory, the answer is, well, you lose it. You lose whatever you had in memory. Okay, now when people have been installing uh, PyTorch, it seems like uh, they've been running into multiple problems. One is that uh, we are running out of storage space, uh, but also uh, we are seeing that people are under a kind of running out of RAM. Uh, just the installation process itself was sometimes using up too much RAM, and, uh, and, and that was a problem. And so there's a workaround here, and that is even though it's slower and not ideal for the things memory is used for, uh, we can use that extra space and storage as, as memory, right? Um, and so what will happen then? Well, slower and, uh, well, we don't really care about persistence if we're kind of using it for a memory application. So when we do that, when we take some of our hard drive or SSD or whatever storage we have and say, I'm going to use this not to save files, but to kind of act as extra memory that's bigger but slower, um, that space we're setting aside is called swap space. And, uh, and, and usually by default, swap is disabled. Uh, but if we enable it, we can make uh, certain things possible, like installing PyTorch, um, and it'll be a little bit slower, but at least we'll be able to get the job done. Uh, so here I have some directions on, on how to do that. And I'm just gonna kind of walk through these. Uh, the, the first step is that we wanna install this tool called HTOP, which will let us monitor, um, kind of monitor how much memory we're using. Uh, so I'll do that. Uh, then we're gonna create some swap space um, and then uh, step two, I've already actually installed uh, PyTorch on my computer, so I'm going to skip step two. Uh, but if we do step one, uh, step two should work. And then, then step three is just kind of removing the swap space. And that, that's optional if you want to remove it when you're done. Let me head over here to my terminal. And let me SSH that machine. And, and I'm actually going to uh, SSH twice. I need to have two windows for this. Let me clear this. And um, and so this first thing is we need to install htop, uh, which would be sudo apt install htop. And I've already done that, so that's not trying to really do anything here for me. Um, and so once I've done that, I'm going to run htop. And htop is going to show me what processes are using um, the most memory and CPU on my system. And, and, and maybe most conveniently overall, it's showing me up here at the top or if I can highlight this, maybe no. Um, it's showing me uh, how much CPU and memory um, I'm using. So right now I'm using very little CPU. My cores are mostly idle. Um, I'm using a good bit of memory. And then I can see down here, SWP is swap. And currently there's zero swap available on this system because I haven't enabled it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now 
uh, before I try to do any sort of install of PyTorch is I want to make some swap enab enabled. And, um, and so how can I do that? Well, there's a few pieces. First, I have to create some sort of file and we're going to have that be slash swap file that I'm used for my swap space. And um, I'm going to use this file allocate command to quickly create a four gigabyte file um, like that. Kind of a strange way to be creating a file, but the reason I'm doing this is because um, rather than writing a file is I just don't care what's in it. So when I don't care what's in a file, but I want it to be a specific size, I use this f allocate command. Not something that you're going to be using every day. Kind of it's um, very special purposes like this. Okay, so let me make this a little bit larger. And let me clear this. Okay, and, um, and so I'm going to allocate that thing. If I say ls lah on slash, um, I can see, cool, I created this four gigabyte uh, file. Um, what's next? I need to do ch mod, and then this code, and then this. Mod is really saying, well, who has permission to access this file? And um, different numbers here represent uh, kind of different uh, information about who can access it. And I'm not going to get into those details now, but it turns out that a 600 uh, means that um, that uh, that there's going to be kind of limited access to this file. And um, and so actually, there's one more step I need to do here that I forgot, which is ch own that's root swap file. I want the root user to own this file so that other people can't be reading it. So let me. Let me clear this. Uh, I wonder if I, okay, great. So I do that, so now the owner, I, ch is for change. I change the owner of that file to root. And, um, and now I'm gonna say that, that this command is basically saying that only the root user can access this file. Um, it's not, not super important, but I mean, you can imagine a problem um, where let's say I'm running a web browser or something that has access to my passwords. And uh, those passwords are in memory, but then they get put to swap. Um, I wouldn't really want it to be that easy for other programs uh, on my computer to kind of somehow extract that password. Right. So this is we're just trying to be a little paranoid here about security. Okay, so I'm going to run this one now, and this one is what is this one doing? It's making some swap space um, out of that that file. Right. So it turns out into a swap file, and uh, and so that's good. Um, okay, and then the last thing I need to do is I need to uh, enable it. So that's sudo swap on slash swap file. And um, why is that not kind of auto completing? Um, and uh, when I do that, you're going to notice that up in here in this htop window, uh, this swap space right beneath the memory um, is going to become available. Instead of having zero kilobytes, we should. Uh, get four gigabytes, and indeed we do. Right, we got these four gigabytes, and um, and we aren't using it yet. Okay, at this point, this command, which I know a lot of people have been troubling with, have been having trouble with, um, should work. Uh, I mean, definitely let us know during office hours if it's not. I'm not trying to do it now because I've actually already installed these programs, so uh, it wouldn't be a, a good test anyway, right? But I've seen this work for people now after we've uh, kind of created this swap. Now, when this is all done, uh, you uh, have a choice, right? You could leave the swap space on if you like. Um, I don't love using swap space because it can make things uh, slower, right? And if I don't really need it, I'll often disable it. Um, so when you're all done, right, you might choose to do swap off on the swap file. And, um, and then you see it draws away. And, um, and if swap space was being in use because you just installed something that might take a long time to run. It didn't for me because there was really no data there right now, but that'll probably take a long time, maybe like a minute to run that command. And um, and then just to kind of free up some space on my virtual disk, I'm gonna at the end say sudo remove swap file. And well, why do I have to do the sudo thing even for this? I kind of use sudo for everything except the pip install. Uh, well, because I did ch own earlier, and, um, and ch own says that the root user owns that file, right? So I can't just go around uh, removing files from uh, the root user, right? So it's like, well, no, you can't do that. Sudo, guess what? I, now I can because uh, I have sudo privileges. Um, I wouldn't have to run that for a normal command. Okay, so give that a try before you carry on. It'll take you a little while to actually do all these steps. And, and this installation step will actually take um, 
who knows, maybe like 10 or 15 minutes and that's fine, but just do that before you move on to the next video.